Please be seated. Seems like the last time I was here was also the Feast of St. Michael. It's great to be with you on your patronal feast. A part of what it means to have a patronal feast and to celebrate, in essence, your namesake, why you were named this church, is to live into a certain piece of gospel truth that really ought to be highlighted and emphasized, given something that is due, and thinking about, as a result, the implication of what does being called St. Michael's, what does that have to do with the vocational calling of the life of this church? Because I think names mean something that they're not just random, although I, I did hear that a long time ago when a lot of churches were founded under, uh, in the diocese, that Bishop Laudit at the time, who had planted a number of churches in the mid-1950s or so, would literally sort of show up and look and say, okay, what's the saint calendar for today? And that would be the name of, the day of that church, the day that church was planted. But even if it were literally that random, I have a sense that more often than not, God's hand is in it. And it has something to say. And so here we are talking about Michael, Saint Michael, the archangel, called saint, not because Michael used to be a human being who was made into an angel, but because saint is often designated for a being, either angelic or human, because it means they've been set aside by God for a particular purpose. And if you know your history in terms of the Old Testament and the like, Michael was a messenger and is a messenger because he is eternal. And so that is in some ways the first clue of, okay, what does, why, if we are St. Michael's, what does that mean for us? And I think a part of it does mean that there is a messenger herald quality about your calling, as in you as a congregation have something ordained by God to say to the rest of the world. You're, you're at that sense, you're a speaking church. It, and so that as you get out there and do ministry, connect with neighbors, enter into acts of service, whether it's feeding the homeless or other things that you might choose to take on, there will always be a component of that of how will people know why we do what we do? Are they just going to intuit it? Well, one would hope not. That in fact, that there would be a piece that says we do this because we are in fact servants of Jesus Christ. And, and that that say, is said in fact explicitly. In other words, it's something that is declared because that is the nature of your vocational calling. The other piece of that has to take seriously in a way that's actually ser terribly countercultural. The whole idea that we live in a world that is in fact surrounded and filled with, as the liturgy says, angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. And in fact, we even prayed at the beginning of the collect that there is this ordered ministry that takes place between angels and mortals, to use the collex phrase. And a part of what that indicates is angels are around here doing things. I mean, in fact, a part of what even the architecture of a church is meant to express is that it is meant to express visually what is true spiritually, that we don't necessarily see with the naked eye. And so there are pictures, as it were, of people who have gone before us, therefore surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. And a part of what's included, of course, in that is angels, because it's meant to remind people that when they come into this place, this is a part of the eternal picture of what, in fact, the world looks like. It's a part of what we mean in the, um, in the creed when we say that we believe in one God, the Father, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and what? Of all things, visible and what? Invisible. invisible. Well, what do we mean in Invisible. Well, that has to do with things like angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. Uh, Luke Timothy Johnson, the writer of, in fact, a very good book on the creed, talks about declaring that as expressing the mystery, 
that lies within and beyond the merely material. In other words, you and I, if we say we actually believe those things, take into consideration as we go about our day that it's not just about what we can see with the naked eye, but that in fact we are surrounded by and perhaps even influenced by both eternal conflicts between the spirit of light and the spirit of darkness, but more importantly than that, guided and assisted by the very ministry of angels themselves. I would not poo-poo, in other words, people who tell angel stories. Now, sure, any of us can wind up being delusional. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, is that most of our schooling, in terms of the way that we judge the very nature of reality, causes us to be very suspicious of people who talk about things that you can't see with the naked eye. Empirical evidence is the term used. I'm really sympathetic to that because, believe me, it is very possible to be religiously delusional. And sometimes the most dangerous things that can ever be said is when somebody comes up and says, well, the Lord told me to tell you. <laughs> Unless that's somebody you trust, I would encourage you to run in the other direction. Not that, the, not that God cannot and does not speak prophetically through the mouths of people. God, in fact, does that. But it's still dicey, and the scripture is very clear about the fact that prophetic words should be judged. In other words, just because I heard God say to me, as I might say, that actually may or may not be true. And so I go to other people and say, as I pray, this is what's happening and this is what comes to me. What do you think? And hopefully if there are people who love and care about you, then they'll say, well, let's look at the scripture together and let's see if we can discern something that God actually might, trying, might be trying to say. In other words, test is the word that is used in the scripture around people who have those sorts of words. But the point is, is that they're not impossible and in fact could be a part of the flow of a church's life. I know right now a congregation here in this city, an Episcopal church, who is really wrestling with the issue of the place of God speaking through individuals in the congregation. What does that look like? How do we train for it? How do we test it? And how can we yield the fruit of what God might be saying through somebody other than the rector? No disrespect intended, Father Reed. <laughs> so... We live in a world, in other words, that is meant to be packed, not meant to be, but is, but we don't often see it, packed with the supernatural, and occasionally it breaks through, and breaks through in a way that sometimes we notice, and in fact, sometimes we don't. I think when we finally get to heaven, and the books are open, and we begin to see how we were utterly rescued at the last minute in a car accident, or you fill in the blank, had everything to do with direct and angelic intervention. And I've had a couple of incidents in my own life which I thought, hmm, that might have been an angel. So, again, I'm, I'm wary of people who tell stories, but I also want to pay attention because it could be that what they talk about is true. That's actually a part of what's going on in this intersect interaction between Jesus and Nathan in the gospel. If you back up a little bit before the, the reading, Philip, friend of Nathaniel, is overcome with joy. As he says to him earlier, he says, we have found the Messiah. Now, you need to know when that was said within that context, we have found the Messiah. It was said with awe, trembling, a profound longing and hope. Israel believed deeply that God would come and send a deliverer and set them free from the hands of Roman oppressors, would overthrow injustice and establish a kind of heaven on earth. And, and here was a group of people who literally lived under the thumb of a man that they considered blaspheming by calling himself God in the flesh. And the whole idea of somehow being set free from that kind of an oppression where the Romans could come in and just take anything that they wanted, enforce their own peace as it, they described what that ought to be, was, it was beyond apprehension. 
And so when Philip comes to Nathanael and says, we have found the Messiah, he, he's not just sort of saying, I had a great breakfast this morning. Let me tell you where I went to eat. He's talking about literally the longing of an entire people. And so what happens is we have found the Messiah. And what's Philip's response? Because it says it's Jesus of Nazareth. Nathaniel says, like, you got to be kidding me. Nazareth? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? I mean, it's as if we had said, we have found the new governor of the state of Florida, and guess where he's from? He's from Ocoee. <laughs> no ap apologies to those who might be from Ocoee. It just wouldn't have been what we would have expected. A and so... But Nathaniel's curious. He wants to see who this kind of imposter, in essence, might be. And that's where our story picks up. The two of them show up, at G and Jesus looks directly at Nathaniel. And this is where the scripture starts that we read this morning. And what is Jesus' response? He does not reprimand him or say, you know, you really showed your ignorance back there. Instead, he says, ah, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. In other words, Daniel, whatever's in Nathaniel's heart, it just comes right out. There's no guile, to use the more classic term. He is, he is not political. He doesn't say what people want to hear. He just speaks his mind. And of course, Nathaniel's like, how do you even begin to know that? What are you saying? Are you... And so, he, and so Jesus says, remember, you were sitting under the fig tree when Philip called you. Now, Nathaniel didn't see anybody. And so far as he knew, Jesus was hiding in the bushes somewhere. So he's shocked because obviously God has given Jesus a piece of supernatural knowledge that he would not otherwise have. That's what just occurred, you see. And so Nathaniel is floored. And just like the Nazareth comment, again, right out of his heart, no filters, he says, you're the son of God, king of Israel. I mean, he's astonished in a way. And he responds in a way that his schooling in Shiva school would have taught him that if there are miracles happening, then it is probably a sign of messiahship. And Jesus, in essence, says to Nathaniel, you know, you have no idea what you're talking about. As in, it's not that what you said was wrong, but what you believe about it is about this high. When in fact, the meaning of those words is like this. Do you believe just because I said I saw you under the fig tree? You're going to see greater things than these. What if I were to say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man? Are you ready for that? Like, fasten your seatbelts, Nathan. We're about to launch into something for which you are entirely unprepared and let's go and see what happens. Now, we have no record of Nathaniel having the experience of actually seeing angels ascend and descend. And in fact, it could be an allusion to Nathaniel's eventual martyrdom, because if you recall, when Stephen was stoned to death in the book of Acts, he says almost this very quote that Jesus says to Nathaniel, I see the Son of God standing at the right hand. In other words, Jesus literally stands up to receive Stephen, as he is about to be stoned to death into heaven. The point of what Jesus is trying to say to Nathaniel is, you believe about this much. You know what's in front of you? This much. I'm inviting you into literally a world for which you are ill-prepared. A world filled with angels ascending and descending, and where Jesus himself is Lord over all. Are you ready for that? I think that is exactly the same invitation that God extends to us. When we stand up and we say the creed, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I think what's true for most of us, and myself included, is that when I say those words, my belief level 
in their import, their impact, and their depth is about this high. And yet, those words speak of realities that are like this. In fact, I say this all the time because it's to my, my own wonderment that the more I know, quite honestly, the more I realize I don't know. That I'm being invited literally into reality, into a way of seeing the world. Not just somehow, what am I doing? I'm asking Jesus into my heart, and I live in basically the world of reality in the midst of all of that, and yet Jesus is here, and Jesus might be up there somewhere, you know, sitting on a throne or in heaven, wherever that is. And my job is to sort of live it out and do whatever I can with the best I have. What an incredibly truncated view of salvation. Just the opposite is true. When Christ begins to break into my life, I'm literally invited into a different way of seeing the world. I'm invited into a world packed with the presence of God that has always been true, always been there, always operative, but I'm one of the slow ones who still lives in a kind of enlightenment reality that only wants to believe in and think about and react to the things that I can empirically see. And that knowledge is about like this in comparison to this extraordinarily huge, varied, multi-level supernatural world, which is, in fact, the accurate way of seeing reality. And it's always small. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, we now see as in a dim vision of a mirror. We know in part. And so what it should evoke in us is not only a sense of wonder, but also an extraordinary sense of God. Uh, I'm like a child being invited into something of which I don't know much about at all. I need you to take me by the hand and lead me into that world so I can see the world I see more accurately and operate accordingly. Because, as you know, if you're going to make decisions about your life, or anything for that matter, you need the best information possible. Otherwise, if you make a decision based on faulty information or incomplete information, it's not going to get you where you want to go. No, you need the best information possible. What we're trying to say here is, guess what, brothers and sisters? This is great information. What would it mean for you to begin your day and say, oh God, in the midst of a world for which I only see this much, guide me into larger realities. Guide me into larger realities. It's an admission that I am so blind, in fact, to the things that matter most. Help me see people, God, not not as I see them. You see them as eternal beings, children of God, destined for eternity. Help me see that. And help that to come into account as I deal with them over everything from, you know, who owes what money at the lunch counter. I mean, all the normal stuff of life. Who knows but the person who came to your aid in that moment when you needed somebody to show up might have been an angel of God. Who knows that the person that you so easily dismissed, in fact, might have a destiny that could change things in a radical way. God has the most incredible ability to take the least likely people and use them in the most extraordinary ways. We have a pecking order that's very clear and well-defined. And it has everything to do with what we can see. It has everything to do with who their family is, where they went to school, what their neighborhood is, who their friends are, where they belong, etc., etc., etc. It is, in fact, a childlike box of toys that ill-equips us to deal with people effectively. Because they are so much more than that. So much more. God. Help me to see people as you see them. So, in other words, this is big doings, celebrating this feast. 
It's inviting us into something that we don't think about very often. But it has everything to do with learning how to live in this world as witnesses for Christ with a level of realism, supernatural realism, and effectiveness that in fact could make a difference, a profound difference in the course of the city, your business, your family, where you live and work. Because believe me, the City Hall of Orlando, the Country Club of Orlando, the Rosalind Club of Orlando, Princeton Elementary School are just as packed with the presence of God angels and archangels and all the company of heaven as St. Michael's Church. Who knows whom you might meet in Publix? Are you there? Lord, help me. <laughs> help me to see the world as you see it. That I might serve you effectively and live in a way that really does reflect your love and the great kingdom that you are breaking in to this world to give us. Amen.